All right, everyone, welcome to the last webinar of Opera Next Gen's season. It is strange to think that this is the last webinar of the season. However, we are ending on a high note and so grateful for everyone who is able to attend today. Um, I'm Calabria Webb. I am the Director of Outreach and Education here at Opera Next Gen. And once again, welcome. I am going to take the time to introduce our special guest. Uh, Dr. Lily Cass is an interdisciplinary scholar and educator whose work focus, focuses on the diverse ways in which operas are reimagined, adapted, and translated to meet the needs of new audiences. She earned an AB in literature from Harvard University in 2010 and a PhD in musicology from the University of Pennsylvania in 2017. Lily currently teaches musicology courses at the Peabody Institute in Baltimore, and she has also taught at Temple University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Westchester University. Her courses, which include Powerful Women in Opera, Mozart's Operas, and Exoticism on the Musical Stage, seek to empower students to engage creatively with the operatic canon through research, analysis, and critique. Lily is a trained coloratura soprano, and she co-founded the Opera Scenes program at the University of Pennsylvania, which she directed from 2014 to 2018. She currently serves as a Marian Anderson Scholar Artist with the National Marian Anderson Museum and Historical Society, and as a member of Opera Next Gen's advisory board. I will tell you all, I had to cheat and truncate the bio. The bio is something serious. If you want to see that, feel free to visit our website, uh, operanextgen.org, and you can read even more about Dr. Lily Cass. But until then, please give her a warm welcome and welcome her as she begins her powerful presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Calabria, for that great introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, perfect. The repertoire of most American opera companies is made up in large part of operas written in a, in a language other than English. This makes translation a necessity for English speaking American audiences to gain access to the alchemical interaction between words and music that lends the art form its amazing emotional power. Opera companies today are actively recruiting new audiences and strengthening their core audience groups, fighting against the notion that opera is a dying art form. However, most professional companies and educational programs alike fail to adequately address one element of production that greatly affects the experience of English speaking audience members, the translation of the operatic repertoire. Translating opera is not something new. On the contrary, translation has played an integral role throughout opera history. Operas often circulate far beyond the place where they are first produced. Changing the language of an opera creates an opportunity for the translator to add in explanatory language, change archaic references, and otherwise adapt the work to fit the needs of new audiences, mediating between disparate places, time periods, and cultures. This presentation will explore the history of opera translation, examining what it means to translate opera and the reasons why operas are translated. It will conclude with suggestions for how through thoughtful and ethical translation practices, translations can continue to serve an integral role in bringing opera to new audiences. <clears throat> At first, translation was not a necessary piece of opera performance, since the first operas were performed in Italy with Italian language libretti written to be heard by Italian speaking audience members. <clears throat> However, we also know that even when operas were performed in the native language of the audience, that did not mean that their words could be immediately understood at first hearing. The text of the opera was almost always printed so that the audience could read it before, during, and after listening to the performance. 
In addition, early opera's excitingly innovative and creative properties led to its popularity, and in turn, it spread beyond its original political, cultural, and linguistic borders. This meant that soon after opera's creation, the genre was reaching places where it was no longer a vernacular form, and it became thought of as foreign. The first um, and probably earliest, at least the earliest well-known example of this phenomenon is the case of Erismena, an opera written in 1655 by Francesco Cavalli to an Italian libretto by Aurelio Aureli. An anonymous translator created an English language translation in London about 10 years later. The translation of Erismena from Italian to English for English speaking audiences is an early example of the vernacularization of opera or opera being translated into the language spoken by the audience so that audience members could hear opera sung in the language that they understood and spoke in their everyday lives. This kind of translation helped to domesticate foreign cultural products, making them more accessible to the ears of local audience members. It is also an act of reclamation, an expression of the sentiment, opera is not only Italian, it can be ours or English too. This has been the most common reason to translate opera from the 17th century to the present day. I'll just play you a little tiny clip of the English translation of Veris Mena. Um, and what you will probably notice is that it is difficult to understand, even though it is in English. Um, so my earlier point that translating opera doesn't necessarily um, lead to immediate understandability um, for the audience. Um, here you go. <laughs> So as you probably heard, the, um, the tessitura of that um, part of the aria, the pitch was pretty high in the singer's range. And so vowels were modified and consonants weren't as clear. And so you have to listen really, really hard to um, identify that it is in fact in English um, and then understand the words. <clears throat> but there were other reasons to translate operas in addition to understandability. In fact, some opera producers didn't want opera to be easily understood, thinking that its very foreignness gave it an exotic appeal. During the 18th century in London, even as some Italian operas were being translated into English, like Arismena, others were being presented in Italian, and some were even being translated into Italian from languages like French to be presented to English-speaking audience members. The English essayist Joseph Addison wrote in The Spectator in 1711, an essay in which he intended to trace the development of Italian opera in London. In this sarcastic commentary on the linguistic practices of operatic performance at the time, he writes, I cannot forbear thinking how naturally an historian who writes two or 300 years hence and does not know the taste of his wise forefathers will make the following reflection. In the beginning of the 18th century, the Italian tongue was so well understood in England that operas were acted on the public stage in that language. Of course, most English audience members at the time did not understand Italian. Addison is here describing an early iteration of the phenomenon that might seem like a matter of course to us as American opera audiences and professionals, the foreignness, or more specifically, the Italianness of opera. The idea that Italian is the perfect language for opera, um, for singing opera, is also responsible for several well known 19th century operas, such as La Fille du Regiment and Don Carlo having more than one performable version from the same year. So we see here La Fille du Regiment was premiered in February of 1840 in Paris in the French language. And in October of that same year in Italian in Milan, Don Carlo as well in French in Paris in March of 1867, Don Carlo in Italian 
June, so just a few months later of that same year, and we notice it's in London, right? So translated from French to Italian for London. <clears throat> At a certain point, the assumption that opera was necessarily and even desirably foreign even led to the bizarre practice of operas being performed in multiple languages at once. Sometimes these linguistic pastiches were on purpose, um, such as the relatively common practice of performing arias in the original language while translating recitative or spoken dialogue into the vernacular. We, this, we see this frequently today in productions of Mozart's 1791 Singspiel die Zauberflöte, which are performed um, in German with English dialogue and it's advertised this way in these various for these various opera companies over the years. Sometimes, however, these linguistic hodgepodges have been accidental, a result of insufficient rehearsal time or resources. For example, in the 1890s at the Metropolitan Opera, Meyerbeer operas were originally performed with the prima donna singing in Italian, while the chorus sang in the original French. In the 1920s, Swedish, Finnish, and sometimes other languages could be heard alternating on the stage of the Finnish National Opera, as Finland strove to accommodate the multiple languages spoken by its roster of international singers and its audience members. Even as language barriers between stage and audience were actively maintained and cultivated, there has always been a strain of vernacular first opera companies who make it their mission to always perform opera in the language of the audience. The most common examples still present and popular today in the English speaking world are the English National Opera and the Opera Theater of St. Louis. In their promotional materials, these companies present a strong claim that singing operas in English to English speaking audiences forges connections and invites audience engagement in some that it enhances accessibility. ENO's mission statement includes the following language. We believe that singing in English enhances the emotional connection between performers and audiences. Opera Theater of St. Louis writes, we champion opera in the language of the audience since opera is for the masses. The Chandos record label, which produces a series called Opera in English, likewise states, Chandos Opera in English aims to make opera available to a wider audience by presenting the performances in English. Discussions of accessibility like these may seem out of place in reference to opera, which has long been considered an elitist art form. Part of opera's allure has historically been its association with royalty and its reliance on large casts, staffs, and crews, opulent costumes and scenery, and even costly machinery, making productions expensive to mount. In fact, accessibility is important in part because of its economic effect. Wealthy patrons no longer provide sufficient support to keep opera companies afloat, and it is important for opera companies to diversify their revenue streams and their audiences alike. In addition, as cultural gatekeeping is increasingly criticized in all sectors, the optics of accessibility is necessary for opera houses. <clears throat> Singable English translations, like those performed on the Chandos label and by Ino and the Opera Theater of St. Louis, <clears throat> and like Eris Mena from the 17th century, are not the only ways to make opera linguistically accessible to audiences, however. In the late 20th century, technology evolved that allowed operas to be made accessible to audiences, at least linguistically, without the help of singable translations. Supertitles, also called surtitles, which serve a similar role to that of subtitles in foreign film, have the capacity to succinctly provide the important semantic content of the opera's libretto to an audience who does not speak the source language. The practice of reading a translation while listening to the foreign language original has been in place for centuries, as opera libretti were almost always published to be read by the audience, and a translation was included when the opera was not in the audience's vernacular. 
Super titles are meant to improve this practice by ensuring that all audience members read at the same pace and that their reading lines up with the text being sung. There is the potential to fall behind or get lost in the printed libretto translation, but super titles do not allow audiences to dwell on a line of text for longer than it takes a singer to sing it. This promotes a shared audience experience, but also a passive one. It also allows for musical punchlines in humorous or dramatic texts to be delivered precisely, not too early, not too late. Of course, a skilled and well-rehearsed super title operator is essential to this practice. I personally have both written and operated super titles, um, and I would be happy to talk about that experience more in the Q&A, um, but the short story is it's really difficult, um, much more difficult than, than you might think. When super titles first debuted on a large scale at the Canadian Opera Company in 1983, and this production is pictured here, it was Electra. Um, many music critics were viscerally repulsed by the concept. One of the major critiques was that super titles promoted a certain kind of laziness in audience members. David Pountney of the English National Opera famously referred to super titles as, quote, celluloid condoms between the audience and the immediate gratification of understanding, colorfully implying that the mediating function that the titles provide dulled the experience of the audience. In 1989, Robert Anderson, a critic for the Musical Times, wrote of his, quote, deadly loathing for the surtitle. He wrote, why insult our audiences by assuming they cannot be bothered to read the splendid background material of the Royal Opera program book? Why encourage lazy listening by offering a pitiful little substitute for the relevant opera guide and study of the libretto? His notion that attending the opera must be hard work that requires advanced preparation and a certain amount of education is clearly elitist. What he reacts against is precisely the new accessibility that supertitles afforded to those who did not have the leisure time to spend studying up for the opera, or those who cannot afford to buy reading material in addition to the ticket they had purchased to see the performance. For Paul Daniel, a one-time music director at the English National Opera, the immediacy that he perceived in supertitles was indeed its flaw. He wrote, surtitles make audiences passive and castrated. You cannot feel an opera in your bollocks if you are just having the information fed to you. Alice Goodman, the librettist for the operas Nixon in China and Death of Klinghoffer, actively did not want English language supertitles to be present for Klinghoffer, even though her libretto was already in English. So the supertitles weren't translating anything, they were just displaying the libretto that was being sung on stage. Journalist Nancy Mallets reported in the New York Times Magazine in 1991 that, and I quote, Goodman adamantly opposed, said the meaning of her poetry was constantly revealed by the musical score and by the lighting, theatrical presentation, dancers and singers on stage. Calling those in favor of surtitles, quote, flat earth people, Alice Goodman said that the captions would just mislead people into thinking they understood something because they were reading the words. That's the end of that quote. John Adams, the opera's composer, was in favor of supertitles for that same production of Death of Klinghoffer, but he agreed that whether or not to project the opera's libretto for the audience was, quote, like gun control and abortion, there's no faster way to get people screaming at each other. The powerful sexual and political metaphors used by critics and supporters of supertitles alike demonstrate that the stakes of supertitles feel high to many opera goers. Some believe that to commune wholly with the music of an opera, one must effectively forget the existence of the words, while others believe that knowledge of the words is absolutely necessary to fully appreciate the work. The question arises, what are supertitles? Are they merely a way to convey information? The word information implies a sort of sterility of data without a human source. 
the reliance of super titles on new technology reinforced the perception that the contents that the titles displayed were accurate transmissions that had not been subjected to interpretation. It also contributed to separating super titles from the almost 400 year legacy of opera and translation that I briefly introduced a few moments ago. In fact, instead of promoting lazy listening, super titles promote lazy reading. It is rare for audience members to reflect on the translation that they read in super titles or the fact that the words being sung on stage may not correspond to the words that they are reading. Audiences were shocked into noticing the super titles at performances of Verdi's Rigoletto at the Metropolitan Opera in a 2013 staging by Michael Mayer. The production set in Las Vegas during the 1960s combined its neon casino sets with super titles written in the slang of the era. And I'm going to now just take a moment to transition my screen so I can play you a clip of an aria from this production. All of the clips available on YouTube did not have um, the super titles, um, which also shows something about them being considered um, not an integral element of opera production. Um, so I will transition to the Met on Demand player to show you this aria. So this is going to be the Duke's aria in Act One of Rigoletto called Questa o Quella. And I think you'll notice pretty quickly what I mean about the super titles drawing attention to themselves. Okay. Here we go. Questa quella per te va di sono a cantare, ed intorno, intorno mi vedo, nel mio cuore di fare non c'è la meglia duna che ad altre verità, la tua storia penetra quello, di che il fatto ne chiara la vita, soggi questo, Tanto gravita, forse avrà, forse avrà, ma allo sarà una tra, forse una tra, ma allo sarà. La costanza girata del cuore ne testia, con quel morbo, quel morbo crudele. So chi vuole si sembri fedele, non mi amor, se non ve libertà, de marriti il geloso furore, degli amanti le sue mani e termina, tanto d'argo, il cento che di sfido, se mi fugge, se mi fugge, una qualche beltà, se... Okay. Did everyone see what I mean about the super titles? Okay, I'm just going to transition back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So let me explain a little bit about what was what was happening there, what you just saw. So Michael Panayos and Paul Cremo of the Metropolitan Opera said they, quote, rejiggered Sonia Friedman's more literal translation of Rigoletto to create titles like, my sights are set on a swinging girl, so hop on baby, let's take that whirl. That particular English line of text is shown as the Duke sings in Italian, anco d'argo i cento di sfido, se mi punge una qualche beltà or I would even face Argus's hundred eyes if I were stung by some beauty. So it's a line of text 
in the Italian that originally rather eruditely um, mentions the 100 eyed giant who jealously watches over Zeus's lover Io at Zeus's wife's Hera's request. So um, Zeus won't, won't cheat on Hera. Um, so that's the original context. And this translation turns it into an almost meaningless bid for physical affection from an unnamed woman or maybe just any woman. So a, a big transformation in terms of the kind of language that is used there, although the main idea remains the same. <clears throat> Michael Meyer refused, referred to the effect of these updated translations as the quote, bada bing. In other words, something surprising and novel. In fact, many audience members found these titles distracting. The titles forced audience members to confront the role that all super titles play in all opera productions at the Met and across the country. Super titles do not simply contain information. They are not even necessarily a shortened version of the source text or the essence of what is being sung. Super titles can lie, deceive, and even betray. But except in rare cases, like the 2013 Rigoletto we just saw, audiences do not notice. Professional opera critics who spend their careers attending and writing about performances almost never do more than mention a translation in passing. <clears throat> Last month, Heartbeat Opera's production of Beethoven's Fidelio made the act of translation so apparent to the audience that the New York Times critic Joshua Barone couldn't help mentioning it in his review. He says the spoken text is in English throughout while the arias remain in their original German. So that language mixing I talked about earlier, which Barone says is a testament to the timelessness of Beethoven. Though the production surtitles take some liberties with the translation, as an excuse for briefly letting the prisoners out into the sun, Rock, the version of Rocco in the production, sings that it's the King's name day, but the titles sing that it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Martin Luther King Jr. was born 124 years after Fidelio's premiere. And this obvious anachronism in the, sub, in the super titles lifted the curtain to show the work of a translator who nevertheless was not named in the review. Supertitle translations become ethically complex when opera companies use English supertitles to help with modern reception of the problematic language and plot points. For example, references to racism, misogyny, exoticism, religious stereotyping, et cetera, that are baked into many opera liberty. <clears throat> These issues are more often than not papered over through deliberate omissions or mistranslations. Peter Lowe, who was asked to provide English supertitle translations for a production of Bizet's Pearl Fishers for the Canterbury Opera in New Zealand in 1999, admitted to having, quote, remedied a defect of the words, end quote, in the opera. In this case, the fact that Bizet's librettist was unfamiliar with the culture of Sri Lanka, where the opera takes place. The Hindu god Siva is male in reality, but the libretto refers to Siva as a goddess. So there's a mistake in the libretto that comes from the ultimate lack of cultural fluency with the people being depicted in the opera itself. So a, a big mistake. Lowe translated the word deus, goddess, as divine one in his titles to avoid reinforcing this culturally insensitive misstep. In other words, the audience never knew that that mistake was in the original libretto. Likewise, the super titles for productions of Mozart and Chickenator's Zingspiel die Zauberflöte, The Magic Flute, often do not translate Monostatos's aria accurately. In the aria, Monostatos, a black slave, sings about the color of his skin and complains that it prevents him from kissing Pamina, a white woman to whom he feels drawn. As the poets W.H. Auden and Chester Coleman wrote in their preface to the magic, their magic flute translation, and I quote, 
Probably no other opera calls more for translation than Die Zauberflöte, and for a translation that is also an interpretation. The libretto is confusing, and what's more, it is filled with racism and misogyny, as we can see in this translation of Monostatos' aria. Many audience members would be taken aback by this characterization of the magic flute as racist and misogynistic, as it is often lauded as the best first opera for adults and children alike. This surprise is in part due to the work that English language translations do and have done for centuries to minimize these very issues. The subtitles produced for the video of the Metropolitan Opera Opera's 1991 production of The Magic Flute take out all reference to race, leaving in only the word dark, which does not necessarily reference Monostatos' skin color. So here we have in the literal translation of the aria, and I should have avoided love because a black person is ugly. The subtitles here say, must I renounce love because I'm dark and ugly. So it minimizes the idea of actual skin color. In 2006, the Metropolitan Opera produced an English language singable translation of the opera by the poet J.D. McClatchy. The opera was also shortened to an hour and 52 minutes in order to appeal to school children. The text of Monostatos' aria in this version, um, this column here, is even further removed from issues of race. So why am I not like the others? I'm despised and ugly too. There's nothing about race in there. And Monostasos' costume, which we can see in this little picture up here, is um, so abstract in his makeup as well that not only is his skin color not apparent, but it is not even clear that he is a human being at all. Ronnie Apter and Mark Herman, two translators who have collaborated on a large number of singable English translations of various operas, write about the Monostatos dilemma in their 2016 monograph, Translating for Singing, Art and Craft of Translating Lyrics. Disagreeing with the view of the source, and by that they mean a black man should not have sexual relations with a white woman, we nonetheless translated it but gave an alternate version to be used if the artistic director did not wish the racist idea expressed or had cast a non-Black as Monostatos. This alternate translation by Apter and Herman, just like J.D. McClatchy's singable translation and the 1991 subtitles, does not showcase the meaning of the source text. And in fact, from the super titles alone, the audience has no way of knowing that the original text was about blackness and race. And in the process of completing a much larger survey of translations of this same aria, and the data I've gathered so far demonstrates that a large percentage of translations do the same thing. So, I've color coded everything. Only the green boxes are productions that um, subtitle with a literal translation of the text. Um, the yellow boxes minimize references to race and the blue boxes erase references to race. So you see that only two out of these many productions of the magic flute um, refer to race as um, forthrightly um, a black equals ugliness in the way of the original text um, that then um, out, of, out of all of these translations. So it, it's really a very common practice and this is just an example of it. Because the voice of the translator does not seep into the consciousness of the audience in these super title translations, um, as it does, for example, in the case of the Metz Rigoletto that we saw together or Heartbeat Opera's Fidelio, the resulting translation does not catch the audience's attention. Audiences can be soothed into ignorance by these translations, which smooth over difference, denying that it exists at all. This calls to mind the Italian adage, tradurre e tradire, to translate is to betray. In the case of 
the magic flute singable translations for children, for example, the original text is no longer present in performance. However, in the case of all of those super titled productions that I showed in the table, the singer playing Monostato still sings the original German words while the super title screen neutralizes them. Perhaps W.H. Auden and Chester Kalman got it right with their translation of Die Zauberflöte, which ends with a postscript spoken by the Queen of the Night and directed at the translators themselves. This postscript includes the following stanza, which calls attention to the often unacknowledged role that the translator's personal politics play in their opera translations. So this is Astra Fiamante, which is the name that they give to the Queen of the Night in this translation from 1956. And she says, in act two, we observed you saw fit to contrive a later appearance for us and deprive our rage of its dialogue we shall survive to laugh unimpressed at your liberal correction of conservative views about women's subjection. Male vanity has always been our best protection. This addendum to the opera breaks the fourth wall and reveals the work of correction, of translation and adaptation that has been done behind the scenes in order to make the text of the opera more suitable for modern audiences. This kind of interruption and commentary may very well point to a more ethical way forward. Opera translations are a valuable part of revitalizing opera production in America and beyond. The mere existence of translations, whether singable translations of supertitles, is not enough to maintain audience attendance, however. For audiences to be genuinely engaged in an opera, the translations must be deliberate and thoughtful. In translating opera today, a connection should be actively formed between the past and present, between the stage and the audience, and between the words and the music. Understanding past methods of translation, as well as the reasons for such translations, can help the opera community not only attract new audiences, but to keep them interested season after season. The accessibility that opera translation provides is important. It is one step towards reducing gatekeeping in the art form. It brings in new audiences, it inspires new composers, librettists, and performers who could then go on to create their own new works. And it at and at best, it even enriches the English language and its literature. At the same time, I believe it is important for us to confront the issue of translation head on. We know the pros, but what about the cons? How can we maximize trust between audience members and opera companies so that the flaws in the operatic repertory are laid on the table to be discussed and critiqued and not just silently reformed? I disagree with one thing that W.H. Auden and Chester Kalman say. They write, quote, if audience members wish to enjoy the advantages of opera in English, they must put up with the drawbacks. I don't think that's true. Audience members are smart enough to be given more information. Translations can make texts available without hiding the original. And I think that drawing attention to the act of translation is a good first step. Thank you. At this time, we'll be happy to have um, questions in the chat or um, simply just coming off mute. Uh, that was a lot to digest. Uh, <laughs> That was a lot for me to digest, but I, I'll let someone else uh, go first. Um, again, once again, you can just take yourself off of mute. Um, if we get a couple of people at the same time, then we, you can, we can use the raise hand function. Yes, go ahead, Suzanne, it's fine. Okay, great, thank you so much. And thank you very much, Dr. Kass, for this um, awesome presentation. Um, it was really cool to um, hear about your work and to see and hear so many different examples. Uh, and speaking of examples, I was wondering, I remember a production from um, Opera Next Gen last year 
of Cosi Fan Tutte, in which some of the ensemble work was represented by, you know, the, the super, super subtitles on screen, but a, a text messages going alongside of characters having private conversations with each other. Yeah. And that really amazingly represented exactly what uh, Da Ponte was and Mozart were trying to get after of uh, people having these asides, almost like you know, the aside in a Shakespearean play in which someone's talking directly to the audience in a way that the other characters can't hear. I thought that was super cool. Have you seen other um, developments in supertitles like this or subtitles like this uh, in ways that use multiple forms of media that convey this sort of um, these sorts of different uh, levels of conversation happening. I'm uh, just curious. Thanks, thanks, Suzanne. That's a great question. I think I think Suzanne and I actually watched that production together. So <laughs> um, yes, we did. I'm glad you got it. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, this is something that I, I you know, as as Calabria said, there was so much already in this talk that I, I couldn't add more things. But this is another aspect um, of of translation and people thinking about super titles and and different ways today, um, in terms of integrating them into the production, not just in terms of the types of language being used, like we saw in that Rigoletto example or the Fidelio example, where you know referring to things in the modern world or, or in the world um, in the era that the um, in which the production is taking place, um, but also um, to integrate it into the scene design um, kind of visually um, to make it a more organic part of the opera. So the Opera Next Gen example that Suzanne gave, um, excellent um, example of that Opera Next Gen um, performs all of its operas live streaming. Um, so I don't actually know what magic they used to do all of those text messages at the same time with, with everything else going on. Um, maybe Calabria knows more, um, but um, it was really great. It became kind of an organic part of the production um, and allowed the translations to be seen at the same time as it was clear um, how the characters were communicating with each other using modern technology in the age of streaming. This was, you know, during the height of the pandemic. So um, people couldn't be in the same room with each other. So um, showing this kind of long distance communication and that was incredibly effective. I've seen other productions where um, super titles are projected like not on a screen um, over the opera stage and um, like many like like is the case in many opera houses and also not on the seat backs of the seat in front of you, which is the case for the Metropolitan Opera, for example, but on um, scenery. Um, so kind of making the super titles part of the scenery itself. Um, so that's another way to do that. Um, that poses some difficulties um, when the operas are filmed, um, which is very um, frequent today that that staged operas are filmed um, because then you know do you focus on that piece of scenery or do you focus on the person singing if you're um, directing the, the cameras um, and so they need to have you know kind of typical subtitles like in a foreign language film anyway so that aspect of the production gets kind of um, diluted in film so that's um, kind of a hurdle for that to overcome that particular conception. Um, but people are trying to think, okay, we now have had super titles um, for you know, 40 some years. Um, do, do they have to always be viewed in the same way? What can we do that's more creative? With them, I would like to see super titles using more um, colors, um, especially in ensembles um, when multiple characters are singing at once. Um, it would be very helpful to kind of color code who is singing. I haven't myself seen that, but some people may be doing it. Um, I think there are lots of um, avenues for exploration for how to present super titles. Thanks, Suzanne. I will interject and say that that's a completely different department. I have no clue how they do that. Um, <laughs> uh, wish, no. wish I did, wish I could tell you, but um, I have no idea how that's done. That is completely beyond me. Um, but I, I do also really like that. Um, I've also been to an opera company in person before, 
and um, watched La Joconda and the super titles were actually via the company's app. Yes, yes, I've seen that as well. I think Upper Philadelphia um, did that for one performance that was in a non-traditional um, space. It was in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in a very small gallery, um, Il Comandimento di Tancredi e Clorinda, the Monteverdi Opera, um, and people could just hold their phones and view the translation. So there are ways to kind of um, surmount the physical obstacles for um, you know, having operas performed in um, non-traditional spaces, or even in a traditional space, if you want the audience to have more of a choice whether to access the super titles or not. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. It, I imagine what those um, critics who, um, <laughs> what they really would have said, the ones that you read from if everybody had their phone out. I mean, honestly, um, that was a lot <laughs> to unpack in a really good way. Um, I think I may have been born yesterday, and I will say this openly while this is recording, and it is going on YouTube, and, I, and I'm aware. I may have been born yesterday with that uh, Monostatos uh, translation, to be honest. It, it's, it's interesting. I've done the magic food a couple of times. Um, I just got done doing it last month. And I know sometimes that aria may or may not get cut, and now yeah. I see why yeah. that gets cut. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe I have translated, I usually um, translate everybody's part so that I have context, mm -hmm. right? But as third lady, you're not really in scenes with him. So, right. you know, you, it's easy to miss what's going on when you're, you know, not on the stage and you don't have to directly communicate at that moment. But um, I, I now am curious to go back and see if my handy dandy trusted Nico Castell mm -hmm. actually um, translated yeah. that. Literally. I actually haven't looked at the Castell in a while. That's that's true. I should see how Castell deals with that. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Nico Castell translations are kind of word by word translations of operas as a guide to singers. So they translate every single word, um, usually as literally as possible. And then if it's too confusing to read word by word, they it, he kind of gives a gloss up at the end. Um, and it also includes the um, text in the international phonetic alphabet to help singers pronounce the text. So a very handy source that um, I hadn't thought to consult for this particular project. I would assume that he would have translated it literally like everything else mm -hmm. um, in his guide, but it would be interesting to see. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't think when I present this material, many people are like, wait, what? This is in this aria. Um, yeah. And I think this is why I want to draw attention to it um, because it's so easy to kind of gloss over. The reason why we don't know is because most of the time it's not shown to us. Um, and I think it's fine for productions to kind of decide they don't want that language shown on screen, right? It could be triggering to some people. It could um, alienate the audience in certain ways. Um, so I'm not saying that um, there always needs to be a literal translation of right. this aria if it's not cut, but I am saying that I think um, the methods used um, to decide that and like what to present to the audience should be more transparent. Um, audiences should have access to the actual information, either in a program note, in educational materials, like a pre-performance lecture. Um, the um, example I gave of the um, of the um, Auden and Kalman translation of the Magic Flute was a very creative example of just like adding text for a singer to say at the end of the opera, like these translators, like what were they thinking, right? Um, right. Or even the example like Rigoletto, where we have to pay attention to the subtitles because it's so clear that it's not what the librettists wrote in the 19th century, right? Or like the Fidelio translation, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, like, whoa, that, that's definitely not in the original libretto, right? That calls our attention to the translator and kind of shows that there's a man behind the curtain, right? Um, like in The Wizard of Oz, um, that, that it's not just this automatic act of translation that we're getting like information, like the Nico Castell, um, resource, right? It's not that someone is doing work. Oh, thank you, Diane. Um, they say the Nico de Castel does translate the Monostatos literally. Thanks for looking that up. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that um, information. 
because now it's like, let me go find my score and dig that out and see. You know? <laughs> um, but again, it's just, it, it is, it is easy to miss, but I mean, it's so alarming, but it does go back to that fascination with exoticism that I think you opened up talking about, which started way before Mozart, obviously, but um, they were fascinated by cultures and people of color, but ridic ridiculing them at the same time. Yes. So of course it would be, you know, incorporated in um, public performance because that was just the, the idea, you know, of, of the time, but yeah, that, that that made me realize that I probably was born yesterday and I need to do <laughs> reading and, um, you know, it, that's why it's important to do your, your due diligence um, in any field, but especially in this one, you know, you, you really have to go through things with a fine tooth comb and it yeah. makes me respect research much more mm. um, than I had before um, because it, you find out a lot, you know, you find out a lot, so. Yeah, I, I think opera companies should be doing that work too. Like Absolutely. individual audience members, individual singers should not be expected to do hours and hours of research. As right. I was saying earlier in the talk, that's kind of an elitist notion that like you you have to do your due diligence and and come in. Um, I think opera companies should should be doing that work themselves. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. Anyone else feel free to. Um just come off of mute. And also again, the chat is open. Hi there, Dr. Cass. Um, thank you uh, for this brilliant lecture. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I came in a little late and I apologize if you already mentioned this at the beginning, but I wonder what your thoughts are um, about super titles on works that are originally written in English for an English audience. Um, you know, what purpose is it serving and is it redundance or necessary or what are your thoughts? Yeah, great question. Um, the one place I referred to that in, in this talk was um, quoting Alice Goodman, who is the librettist for um, a couple of John Adams operas, including the death of Klinghoffer. And she was quoted in a newspaper article advocating um, very much against super titles in her in the original production of Death of Klinghoffer, which was performed in English. Um, and she said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't want to search through my, my talk to find the exact words, but she basically was like, the music, the visual elements, like all of these things with the text combine to give meaning and kind of a, a complex meaning. And <clears throat> having the super titles to read makes the audience feel like they understand the words, but they shouldn't understand the words. Like there's more to understand, right? They shouldn't just feel like, oh, now I know what's going on here, right? Because really what's going on is a very complex interplay between the different elements. Um, so she advocated against the super titles in her production. <clears throat> I haven't really looked into who won, who won that fight. Um, I um, bet John Adams was on the opposite side of it saying that um, they were necessary for people to be able to understand what was being sung. Um, because I also um, mentioned earlier in my talk and I, I played a, a tiny little snippet of this. Um, oftentimes, for example, when I play something to my students in English, they don't realize that it's in English, right? Um, it's so hard to understand sung text um, and sung English in some respects is, is particularly tricky. Um, if there's a particularly high note, you have to modify vowels and you know, minimize consonants and um, any sort of melismatic writing where there's more than one note per syllable kind of stretches out the words in unrecognizable ways. Um, so if the goal is for the audience to understand the text, I think super titles are necessary. If you're on the side of Alice Goodman and you think, just let them understand what they can understand and like get out of the experience what they can and they'll hear little snippets and piece it together. And like that, that makes a um, more kind of aesthetically pleasing um, experience at the opera, then I think that's totally valid as well. So it kind of depends what you want your audience to, to get out of the performance. But great question. Thank you.
like anybody else. All right, if not, let us once again give uh, Dr. Lily Cass a round of applause. That was so, so good. I um, Good is a four-letter word. That was informative. That was eye-opening. That was shocking. That was also refreshing to see um, so many different viewpoints. Um, so thank you once again for having us. And thank you, um, everyone. I can see her uh, contact information is here on the homepage, uh, homepage, do y'all hear me, it's Zoom, it's here on the screen, so uh, feel free, uh, take her, screenshot her contact information, again, this webinar will be on YouTube, and that also brings me to my um, last announcements, once again, um, this is our last webinar of this season, um, boo-hoo, but no fear, there is another season, there will be more webinars, so if you want to know more, if you want to be involved more, again, go to opernextgen.org and sign up for the email list because those emails that are going out are giving you all the information you need to know to register, to be present. And if you can't be actually present, all of our webinars are on the YouTube channel. Um, literally, this one is going up in just a few days as well. I also would like to invite everyone to our end of the season celebration, which will air on April 23rd at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, more details are forthcoming with that event. So once again, the safest place to be is on the email list. If you register for this webinar, um, you, you are already there. For those of you on YouTube, feel free to go um, to the site and do that. Um, and make sure that you actually pay attention to the emails and that you're getting all of the information available. Um, once again, thank you, Dr. Cass. Thank you to everyone who came in today. And I am looking forward to seeing you all at another opportunity with Opera Next Gen. Take care.